on this computer. All right, Taylor Toynes, what's the word? What's the word? Resilience. Oh, Resilience. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you, man. Thanks for joining. How are you? I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Pleased to be in, in presence here with you today. Uh, I love your energy, man. Real talk. I appreciate it. It's the least we can do. Um, you're coming from Dallas, right? Yep. Yep. Dallas, the best city um, that I know of. It's my <laughs> 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 Sounds like a good homegrown way to answer that question. That's right. Oh man, Dallas is a remarkable place. Um, so we're obviously based in Charlotte. You know, we got our listening audience and, and viewing audience coming coming from all over. But uh, you're the first first Texas podcast yes. Um, so no pressure there. No pressure with that. All right, it's fine, man. We the Lone Star State. There you go. <laughs> um, so you know. Speaking of, I know we always try to start with some some lighthearted stuff before we get into work, and we were wrapping quickly before around football. I know it's been a minute, I think, since we watched um, some of the NFL, but, you know, selfishly, it's been a tough year for me growing up as a Cowboys fan in the 90s when it was easy to be a Fairweather fan. Uh, much harder now, but the boys, the boys appear to be struggling. Yeah, me and they are. Uh, hey. They've been struggling for a while, if we just going to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> going to be honest. Listen, I, I read that the team who deals with reality the best wins. So, I'm, you know, it's been a, it's been a minute, you know. I, I've become numb to it <laughs> at this point. It's probably applicable to business and sports and schools and everything, right? Yeah, exactly. The team who deals with reality the best wins. Like, Talk oh. about accountability. That's, that's good. I'm going to start writing all these quotes down. You're saying you better copyright them. <laughs> um, so also want to talk quickly, you know, you know, I know I saw this picture, I think maybe from a few years ago with, with J. Cole and he, he came to a few of the big events you guys throw down in Dallas, with, which we'll get to in, in a minute in the neighborhood, but also heard a rumor that he might have given you guys a shout out in one of the songs. Well, he shouted out the neighborhood. Okay. When he made that song, it wasn't for us. The song was actually the trigger um that allowed us to connect to j cole it's really oh. a powerful situation man how that played out yeah um, our festival happened to be the same day as his concert in dallas right and two weeks before and we were just playing around with it like man we need to get j cole to come to the festival right we didn't know how we would do it maybe a week two weeks max before the festival j cole uh released just a a song it's a freestyle he's and um he said shout out old cliff i'm about to fly to dallas and when he said that everybody was like oh you gotta come right. you know the old cliff like it's the same day as your as your concert and lo and behold um j cole walked in into the festival and and, and was a very humble uh humble guy uh, i would on. also add yeah he's a hard worker man because yeah. it was like 110 degrees this you know summertime in texas correct he stood out there for a good two hours and then um and then left and, and went and did his show that night so that was oh. you know like that's big you know and he did a show like you know he doesn't have any features on his song so right it's all, it him. all j cole it's all him. <laughs> <laughs> uh so did did you guys figure out how he knew about the Oak Cliff neighborhood? Like how that got in the song before he met you all? Yeah, so I believe his father had moved to Dallas. When okay. he, and this isn't the first time that he's mentioned Dallas. Um, but his father moved to Dallas and um, in southern Dallas somewhere. I'm not for certain. Yep. But, you know, J. Cole talked about, you know, he said how he used to go to Redbird Mall, which is the mall in the neighborhood uh, mm -hmm. where we are. Um, so, you know, it was cool that he already had that connection. And then also the other connecting piece was Dennis Smith Jr., who's from Fayetteville as well, yep. was playing for the Mavericks at the time. Yep. So, you know, just all that connection. And I, wow. he, I mean, you know, he, he's a wordsmith, man. He, yeah, uh, he's, great. he's incredible. Yeah, he's a poet. So, you know, he put that together and... You know, it was just destined for that to happen, though. Yep. You know, it just was God's work, honestly. And I know, like, the folks maybe watching on Facebook Live, but also the 
those that will listen afterwards may not be able to see this, but I'm, I'm, I'm peeking into the background. I'm seeing Obama. I think I'm seeing Spike Lee behind you. Uh, yeah. Is that the Wall of Fame? What, what is that back there? If you don't mind me asking. It's, it's just a collection of art. Yep. Uh, you see Obama. Yep. Next to Obama is, is uh, a, a civic leader here in the city of Dallas, Juanita Craft. Okay. Um, next to her is my grandmother. Nice. Um, and the rocket below that is something my daughter drew for me at the beginning nice. of the pandemic. So, nice. yeah, and then I got Malcolm Muhammad. Muhammad, yeah. Um, and then the one right here that I'm pointing at is actually one of my favorite movies is Menace to Society. So, yep. yeah, man, just some art that I, I like art. That's good. Appreciate cool. it. Sorry, sorry to, to put the, the background on blast. Um, oh, no problem. That, man. That's, that's what it's for. <laughs> I obviously haven't met any of them. We, you know, um, NBA All-Star Game was in Charlotte a few years ago. We saw Spike come out of a restaurant, um, mm. try to say hi, but you know, my man was busy and so he didn't have any time for us, which was okay. But that was when, when White Klansman came out. Oh yeah, his son, yeah. not his son, Denzel's son is in this yeah. academy. He had a huge leather jacket that was like shaped, you know, like a, like a KKK hood, but obviously it said White Klansman. I think it was like prepping the movie. So I was like, well, damn, you wanted people to see you wearing that and running around Charlotte. Like, at least, like, let me say hi to you real quick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, didn't have, he didn't have time, which is okay, which is okay. Um, nonetheless, man, you know, like, setting the stage, we've, you know, biasly have uh, appreciate your work, but have had a pleasure of working with you all and supporting you all from afar virtually um, almost two years ago now that as I was thinking about it with Fort Oak Cliff um, and the work you're doing in Dallas, I know you're previously a teacher. And grew up in, in Oak Cliff, but I guess just like as we intro this and intro you, like tell tell the people about the great work happening. One, I think in the Oak Cliff community, but two, specifically within Four Oak Cliff, your organization. Well, Four Oak Cliff as an organization, um, as a movement, has been you know serving the community since 2000. In uh, 15 with the first back to school festival um, and in the classroom with my students. Uh, um, you know, we, we in these past couple of months, well, this past year has been really a transformational year for Fort Oak Cliff. It really is year one um, if we were really to date it. You know, like this is year one and then the, the you know, pr the years prior are like the origin story. You know, like those would be the ones that come out, but um, Fort Oak Cliff now is, is we have our own 501c3, we're an independent entity, and um, we formed our board. And all this happened during the pandemic, which was, you know, which was a trying time to try to get all these. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Like our first board meeting was in April um, this year. So that was, you know, and, and, you know, our team handled it with grace, handled it with courage. Our board has been phenomenal in this year. And um, the four pillars of our work, which are education, advocacy, community building, and the arts, have really um, grown during this time. Yep. Um, just yesterday, um, we gave out 26,000 pounds of food uh, to our community. 26,000 pounds of food. Yeah, I got the invoice right here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Man, so like, look, yeah, that's, that's real. <laughs> yeah. And we did it in like two hours. It was raining. It was a. It was a. I mean, it was. It's, it feel. It feeds my soul. Yeah. When, you know, when you feed people, that's God's work. So, um, you know, we've been doing that every every uh, week. Some weeks we've done fifty thousand pounds of food to the community. Um, but it's really been it's really been an honor to serve with the individuals that have shown up every Wednesday. It's been an honor to serve. Uh, with the individuals that are, are employed at Fort Oak Cliff. We've grown our team this year as well. Uh, we've added two additional staff members, um, full-time staff members. Now we have a, a staff of five at Fort wow. Oak Cliff um, to strengthen our education department. Yep. We were able to hire a director of education who's Dr. Jennifer Hills. Okay. Has, you know, 200 plus people in the GED class at Fort Oak Cliff. Wow. Um, we're about to work on some very innovative, um, I guess you could say research. Um, we believe in a dual gen approach to education yep. and um, something that we've read in, in different, you know, articles, uh, 
reports, whatever, is that African American families um, don't always do as well as other demographics in the dual gen research that has been done. Hmm. What we want to do, and I, and, some, and it, may, it may exist, I haven't seen it, yep. but look at uh, what does the dual gen approach look like, focused on a black family, on black families. Exactly, so, black community. Exactly. So that's something that you know we're. Um, we're looking into right now we're actually we're having a, a meeting about a deep dive on you know how are we going to run that what does it wow. look what are the metrics um because it's important um our mission is we aim to liberate oak cliff from systemic oppression yep. through a culture of education while increasing social mobility and social capital and you know in an effort to do that we want it to be uh transformational and in order for us to do that, we have to show a pilot that can be scaled and then get that scalable pilot That's into right. policy um, to create, to keep movements going collectively. Not, not for the faint of heart, but much needed. And I think, you know, I've shared this with you before, but just to, to frame it up for those listening as well as, you know, we're not talking about one nonprofit and one program and, and nothing wrong or no shade with anything I'm about to say, but to elevate your guys' work, we're talking about, a center, like a community center, a building that's, that's doing food, that's running programming. When you and I first connected, you're talking about opening um, a, a food mart or a fresh grocery um, store to yeah. make sure you have access to, to fresh food in the neighborhood. So it's like, I think understanding the elevation and also like um, the, the innovative thinking that you're bringing is, is, is next level, but I think important for folks to get their head around what exactly all Four Oak Cliff encompasses. Well, Cliff does a lot. Hold on. I don't know who yep. this is. Oh. Nice. Busy man, part of part of the game. Nah, <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. So, sorry. Quick update. Like, it, how, is a. I know you talk about giving food out, which is obviously incredible. But like the grocery store, fresh food mart, is that still on the horizon for what you all are doing? Uh, I'll never say nothing is on. Uh, not on the horizon. Right. Wow, I don't know what this is on my phone. Sorry, sorry. Uh, but no, I would say I don't think that uh, I wouldn't ever count it out. You know, I I don't know. Uh, but right now, I wouldn't say it's it's a it is a priority. The priority is to feed people, but the um, you know that's the main goal to get people fed. But you know, the vehicle which we do it right now at the forefront isn't getting a grocery store anymore and i know like you know we, we like to be as when we have social entrepreneurs like yourself on be as kind of practical as possible and when you talk about j cole giving away twenty six thousand pounds of food like those are big big things but you all we all started somewhere and so wondering like as you reflect on the very beginnings of four oak cliff like what advice would you give to the next taylor toins in, in charlotte and fayetteville and new orleans that is is seeking to make the community better. Hmm. To be conscious as you possibly can be. Um, About everything. Okay. Be very conscious with with uh, your intentions. You know um, the moments that you're in. Appreciate them. You know, really sit in them. It's when we get, and the crazy thing is, is like, you know, even when we look at sports, when someone is putting on their best performance, they say like, hey, he's going unconscious or she's unconscious right now. Yep. And and that's the state that you really get in when you're really into a grind. It's like, man, you get, you 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 can become unconscious. Mm -hmm. But the, the power, the power of it is, is to know how to turn that on and how to turn it off. Mm. Um, you know, like, you know, I read the book, um, you know, the uh, Commitments to Conscious Leadership, and it talked about being above and below the line. Yep. So pay to be below the line of conscious sometimes, but it's the fact you got to know that you did. Um, like when Michael Jordan going off, he knew where he was. Yep. Like he, he knew exactly what he was doing, um, but he was doing it unconsciously. So he knew where he was. And I just think that's something that, you know, people that are starting anything just need to to be very aware of, um, you know, remain conscious in everything that you're doing. 
Yeah, that's, that's great. It obviously makes me think of a lot of things, but specific to Jordan and the Last Dance documentary, which hopefully everybody watched for, for a number yeah. of reasons, but they, you know, you, they talk about his relentlessness and his, his athletic ability. But I think to your point, what came out the most, and I think this was said, was just like his ability to focus and understand the moment. I think to your point was, you know, he wasn't worried about the height. He wasn't worried about his next ring necessarily. He was worried about one possession at a time. Stealing mm-hmm. the ball from Brian Russell, shooting the, the shot, or stealing it from Carl Malone, right. getting the shot over Brian Russell. Like he, he was focused and he was conscious about what was happening and what wasn't happening and wasn't letting anything else deter him from what he wanted to do. Yeah. No, it's, yeah, it's exactly right, man. Yeah, it's um, overlooked, I think, but to, to your point, how important it was to you, I think that's great. And tell us, and, and the folks listening, like, COVID. And so obviously, you know, you're, you're, you're working in the Oak Cliff community, you're building something special that needs to be there. How has COVID uh, made you adjust or made the community adjust to kind of the new reality we're all in? Um, you know, I, I say it a lot, we are resilient people. So, you know, when, when uh, adversity um, is in our face, it, it's it's going to, you know, for all human beings, you know, fight, flight, or freeze. Mm-hmm. And, and now I speak for myself, you know, the the pandemic on the front end, it was like, you know, something we had never experienced. You know, I have a four-year-old daughter. Mm-hmm. Uh, my mother-in-law lives with us and, and um, she has cancer. And wow. it's just, yeah. So for me, it's like, whoa, hold on. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, we had just, you know, we had just became an independent entity. So I don't, I, I know philanthropy, but I'm not looking at markets like that, knowing yeah. like how dollars are going to circulate. I wasn't, pre- well, I, I wasn't looking into it. It wasn't. Or, or the lack of circulation. Uh, and- lack of, exactly. Exactly. Right. So for me, you know, I took all that in, but um, man, you know, I've, I've, I've dealt with trauma my whole life. So, you know, it just made me try to like turn up a little bit more. I guess you could say I was watching my wife going to work, you know, every day, Mm -hmm. you know, and and just looking at her courage as a, as a nurse inspired me, you know, and and then what I began to realize is people were having needs in our community and were coming to us for Mm -hmm. everything. So, you know, Yes, there were, it's a lot, it was a lot of resources um, that came from the pandemic into different, you know, different ways to, to access them. Sure. And every, a lot of folks were coming to us to figure out how to get there, what to do, how to navigate the systems. And it made me realize how much more important we were now um, to individuals because we are a landing, you know, landing space for them. Right. Yeah, I think it's a great point. And also just knowing, to your point around people coming to you, the, the community you've built with, within the community you've grown up in, but also the, the community around Four Oak Cliff, the organization you're leading. And so I guess I'm curious, like, I think I know the answer, but I'm going to ask anyways, of course, it's just like how you've been able to build such intentional community within the organization, but also that folks feel so safe and, and able to come to you. Because you, as you said, you're, you've evolved a number of times, you're fairly new no shade to others, but there's presumably other organizations in or around the neighborhood that have been there for 10, 20, 30 years that maybe say they're offering or doing something similar to you all. But all that to say, like, how, how is just like the community been built where the support is so strong for, let's let's say a a newcomer on the block? Yeah. A lot of it's natural because I'm from the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. You know, it is a, it is a privilege to do this kind of work and have, you know, the ancestors and, and elders that I have in, in my life, you know, like, you know, um, a, a good family is something that can be very beneficial to you in a lot of ways. Like my grandfather, my my father, our names, you know, are, are respected. And that's, um, that was really helpful for me, for one. Mm-hmm. I think to, to the other part of your question, that's just, just wanted to, you know, let everybody know that that's a blessing, you know, that's just natural. Yeah, um, sure. But also, even with that, you know, I could have had bad intentions with what we were doing. Right. Um, and 
And I think that people recognize that over time because if your intentions aren't pure, then um, that means that you're expecting something from somebody, you know? And people will start to feel that after a while and they'll know like, yeah, this just don't feel natural. Um, and for us, our intentions have remained pure um, to serve, right. um, to heal, to encourage. Um, and, the, and the thing about it is too, is like, you know, I, I'm, I'm big on, on being uh, proximal and, you know, you gotta be close to some of that because you know, you, you, man, you can't even, people won't, people will look at you and think that you don't understand because you wasn't part of that. You didn't feel that impact, you know? Sure. Um, people got to see that. They got to see you be there. They got to see you console and see you uh, share the highs and lows. Right. And I think that's something that people have seen with us is the consistency and the, and the true care that we have. Yeah, I mean, you know, on a co-sign, all that, you know, I know we share teaching as a common experience, but it makes me think of, of kids, too, can, can sniff out the teachers that care and the teachers that are doing their best, regardless of skin color or gender or anything else, right? They'll, they'll sniff you out real fast if you're not there for the right reasons. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. They, they the purest form of human beings we have. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Very true. Um, and also, you know, to your point, like somebody some thought leaders so like the best marketing strategy is to care for those you're serving and you know i don't, I don't think you guys call it marketing but essentially the services you're providing is is because there, there's genuine care and support for those you're serving in the neighborhood well no you're right but that's that's just in the core of oil cliff but our marketing is is pretty good too though we intentional <laughs> about that tell, yeah. tell us more then tell us more tell us more man you know, I feel bad because I don't have on a four oak clip hoodie right now. <laughs> so After talking about how intentional the marketing is. Man. Man. <laughs> Step right into that one. Right. All but, right, keep it going. Keep it going. Keep it going. Uh, we um, you know, our brand, you know, is 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 uh something that we stand on. You know, yeah. our brand is uh, you know, it's is is powerful, you know. Um a lot of people believe in that. When they see that four oak cliff symbol, that logo. It, it carries weight. They see the green, they know what that means. So uh, something that, that, you know, we wanted to make sure of is, is uh, people are naturally triggered when they mm -hmm. see something that they relate to. So we have Oak Cliff, you know, in our, in our uh, name, people see that they're automatically triggered. And then once you see and you go into it and then you start to see what it's all about, you know, then people want to become part of the movement and figure out ways to get involved. So, you know, the branding, the from the color to you know the the font, you know that was a uh, that was a real process that we went through. Um, and even you know things like the merch that we have, you know, yep. this stuff that people really want. You know, we we sold, we did, we 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 uh, you know, we used Nipsey Hussle's model with the Proud to Pay campaign. Yep. And last year. You know, we sold hoodies, a hundred dollar hoodie, like for don like people would donate a hundred dollars um, to get a special Oak Cliff hoodie, and people are still asking for that hoodie. We don't have any more. Wow, that was my next question: is how can I buy one? I don't think I have one in, in the closet yet. Yeah, man, they they sold out in in what two days, and we made the first run. We did a hundred, and then we did another run because so many people still wanted them, and it was wow. like, man. This is special. <laughs> you have to let me know when uh, they come back in. I got you. Okay. I got you. Stay tuned. All right. All right. I'm, I'm, you're on. You're on record officially saying that. <laughs> so you can't get out of that. I got you. Um, but to your point around marketing, and, and you know, I think that's good feedback for like the social entrepreneurs out there too. But even just like, you know, I think Facebook, you guys are kind of killing the game in terms of um, just like the community and the outpour in terms of the followers on the page. You have a lot of positive Google reviews on, on Google. So you guys have obviously been savvy and intentional about that. Um, any insight or philosophy you want to share to, to others operating in the space about what works? Uh, be honest. Be honest with yourself and what, what you're going to do. Uh, you know, really think through everything, you know. Um, think through it, you know. Uh, in, in our ways, you know, 
people is the most the most powerful energy it is you know that's the most powerful matter um that you're going to encounter um and build a relationship with so you know treat people right you know uh make people feel welcome make people believe in what you're doing um you got to really and and you know if you if you have heartedly believe in what you're doing then nobody's going to believe in it at all you know you gotta oh people gotta overstand that like man i'm putting it all on the line for this um overstand not understand I like yeah that. overstand that took me a minute, and, took me a minute. that's good and, yeah and they they gotta see it and once people see that once they feel it you know they can relate to it they mm-hmm. see themselves because that's what i feel that people with 40 cliff it's like to me the best thing is people not knowing who i am yeah you know um you know, people come show up for stuff and they don't even know who I am. So for me, that let me know they saw themselves in this. That's why they're here. So and, and why do you say that's important? Like, I think I know, but tell like either founders or just people in the work, why to yourself, it's important that you maybe can operate in the background, but people are coming up not to see you, but to see the programs and the other offerings of the organization. I think that's one of the ways that you can see something is bigger than you. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's what, that's what, that should be the goal, you know, it should be it shouldn't be about a individual um and for me you know like there was a time when everything that came to four oak cliff was directed to me um but being able to to have experiences like that you know like the last back to school festival we had you know i'm just walking the crowd getting to talk to people they have i'm just looking at thousands of people who have no idea who I am and just, you know, taking it all in and recognizing like, it's an eight year old here right now whose life isn't gonna be the same because of this experience they had. That's right. um, and it just made me, you know, it's bigger than me. And that's, that's, uh, that's the goal, you know, is to make, that's how movements grow. You're not successful until you have a successor is the quote that comes to mind. Uh, uh, you're not success. I don't know about that one. Okay. Until, until you can have somebody to to lead the ship. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I hear that. I think that you know, um, not successful until you have a successor. I think it's important that that everybody can keep something going. You know, like every if, if one person go like in the art of war, that's the next thing. Like you, you know, somebody got to be on deck. Yep. Um, but that's the powerful part in being around brilliant people. Like, I hats off to my team. You know, everybody that work at Four Oak Cliff is way smarter than me. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm blessed to be in the presence. You know, of Xavier, Crystal, Jennifer, Unisha, you know, Sydney, Juliana, all these folks right. that that uh, Four Oak Cliff like it's it's really uh, it's powerful, man. Uh, but you know, I think you're successful whenever, uh, whenever you give. I think that's the that's the ultimate measure of success. I like that. That's good. Um, I want to go back to you know offer something from our work selfishly, but then I, I think it relates to you. But in terms of kind of being proximate to a word I, I heard you say, and also being proximate to those you seek to serve. You know, I think we've recently had conversations around how philanthropy has shifted. Um, after COVID, but maybe even before, around how there's um, sometimes in some communities, and, and maybe in Dallas, maybe not, I'll ask you in a moment, but there's a, a tendency to give to certain organizations that are maybe serving other organizations or other populations rather than just giving capital or funds directly to communities that have been marginalized or oppressed for a long time. And right. so the thought being, if we empower families, empower communities, just give them capital that they need, they're, they're smart enough. They know the lived experiences. They know what they need. We don't need like other people building programs and telling them what to do around them to do it. So I guess to your point, knowing you're from the community, you're, you're raising money now and how much the organization has evolved. Like how does that land on you when you hear about philanthropy giving to programs and you, your organization has to write grants presumably and ask for funds yeah. and or just being in the community, knowing now you're raising money to just come directly to you, to the community. Yeah. So, you know, the philanthropy world is definitely shifting right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that there's an understanding of why uh, organizations led by people of color need dollars and unrestricted dollars at that because, you know, 
the person doing the work is the expert on what needs to be done, uh, especially if they have lived experiences. Um, but when we look at major philanthropy, you know, like, you know, let's just say Jeff Bezos' daughter wants to start a nonprofit or his son, I don't know what he has, a daughter or son or yeah. both. But they wanted to start a nonprofit, you know, they have a relationship that immediately allows them to be able to serve countless people, mm -hmm. right? They have, and that's just one relationship that they have with their father. Right. Um, and I think a lot of times when we look at the communities that are most in need, they don't have, the leaders of those communities generally don't have that relationship with someone that could write a million dollar check. You know, off of a compelling story, and then not only that, then give them feedback on on that, and then tell them like, "Hey, I'm gonna connect you with these coaches to yep. help build this out." That's not that's not the privilege that I've had yep. speaking to my on my on my own behalf. Sure. Um, but I've grown those relationships intentionally. You know, like I really I really paid attention. Um, you know, I recognize that relationships are one of the, that's one of the most important things in business, you know, having, having good relationships, but, um, you know, as far as philanthropy goes, I think that, uh, you know, when, when we look at funders, it's a privilege for them, you know, and, uh, for them to be given dollars. Right. So for me, very, very much so. yeah. So for me, a lot of times, you know, I look at it as an opportunity to help refine what we're doing. And that's how I think foundations and funders should look at it is like, mm -hmm. all right, we, we believe that you know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Let us help you refine it, build whatever models. And, and, and that needs to be approached from a decolonized mindset in itself. Um, we focus, a lot of folks, you know, in the world of, of education and business and whatever it may be, talk a lot about um, root cause uh, analysis or root cause, you know, finding the root cause of the problem is, sure. is what I always is what's drilled in. But for me, I'm I'm uh, expanding on what the root cause of the solution is. Mm -hmm. I know the problem, you know, like we've seen the problem, right. we've identified that. Now let's look at what these solutions are, right? And, and and let's see how we can radically fund and change those. So that's what I'm into right now, and I and I hope that we can portray that to. Uh, to foundations, funders, corporations, and really begin to disrupt what that looks like. And yeah, and I know to your point, you, you've had obviously success in the work you're doing, whether it's related to funders or not, but from your perspective, do you see it shifting in, in the, that direction in the right appropriate direction in terms of philanthropy responding in the right way to community needs? You know that's a that's a uh, that's a deep question, and you know when we look at the whole spectrum of of dollars, my answer is no. Yep. Is no um, because it's still too much going on where people are hurt, people don't have resources, and yet during this time we've seen the the top you know five percent of wealth uh grow yeah. um and right now it people haven't been affected equally say that again people haven't been affected equally as response to the pandemic not right at all. yeah not at all. so for me no um i think that people are making strides at it but man like it's a trillion dollar problem in my neighborhood like we're dealing with you know the covid pandemic right now but the crack epidemic was just in the in the seventies, eighties, and nineties. You right. know, like we we never got a stimulus package for that. Yeah, that's this is compounded. You know, yeah. um, and that's something that that I think that the whole picture of it, no, um, because if so, I wouldn't. You know, I wouldn't have to wake up somebody sleep in front of my door at Four Oak Cliff when we there to give out food. Yeah. I'd have the resources to build housing for them. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yep. Then, you know, the, the things you're doing wouldn't be needed, but luckily they have you and, and your team, as you mentioned, and your supporters doing it, um, pushing in the right direction. Man, I, I wish we didn't have to do what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> I wish we could just be enhancing what was already existing, what yeah. already existed and not having to 
fix too many broken systems. But you know what? I take that back because at the core of what we do, we provide joy. So that's that's always it's always going to be necessary. Yeah, I, I think that's right. That's a good mindset. Um, all right, man. I, I know you're a busy dude and got so much to do in in Dallas and in Oak Cliff today. So let me get you out of here with a few hopefully fun and rapid fire questions, if you don't mind. No, let's go. Um, the most innovative thing in in public education or social impact you're seeing. Hmm. You can you can say for Oak Cliff. I mean, yeah, for sure. For Oak Cliff. <laughs> you no, know, I really I'm really I don't know why I just thought about like helmets, getting helmets made. So but I haven't seen that yet. We need to have these bubble helmets for students to wear to school. That talk more be, talk more about that. What do you mean? You know, like a, a helmet that a kid yeah. can wear so they don't have to wear a mask. Nah. You can make it, you know, put technology in it. I don't know, but it's like a a, a space, like Daft Punk, you know, like yeah, those. Yeah. But I don't know, man. Four Oak Cliff has been has been innovative with our dual gen approach to education. I hear a new product being incubated from Four Oak Cliff coming out soon. Stay tuned for, yeah, for, yeah. for those helmets. Taking over um, five new you soon. <laughs> yeah, please. Um, What's one actionable thing the audience can do to improve the lives of others? Uh, wake up in the morning and give yourself about five minutes to meditate on things you're grateful for. And then mm -hmm. everybody you encounter, they're going to they gonna feel good. You're going to leave some, some good residue behind. That's good. You, you journal? Is that like a practice? Whether you journal or not, but that's a, a common practice you have in the morning? It is. That's great. Thank you. And that, that's how we get the, the, the positive presence we get from you every day, which we appreciate. <laughs> All right, last one. Uh, what a square pizza remind you of? What a square pizza remind me of? Uh, Dallas Independent School District lunch. Okay. <laughs> we had square pizza uh, with square pepperonis on them. So public school lunch, man, that's, that's what that remind me of. Was that your favorite subject like mine? as well lunch oh. <laughs> listen in high school man my high school had almost five thousand people in it mm, so good school yeah lunch i had to hurt like I, and i had athletics the next period after lunch so it's like now nah, i gotta eat while going to practice exactly exactly uh you know it's good to know because as we've asked that question selfishly for selfish reasons we've learned that like square pizza is very uh, geographically specific and so not every public school kid like you and I had access or the pleasure of having square pizza during lunch um, so it's been interesting hearing like Philly no square pizza hmm. Milwaukee no square pizza um, so it, I'm, you know it's, it's going to elicit like an interesting research study on like cafeteria yeah. vendors in yeah. schools um, hey, look, my junior and senior year of high school, though, they start making it triangles. Did, did you guys revolt? Did you? No, we didn't. <laughs> we didn't. We just accepted it. <laughs> we just accepted it. <laughs> that, that was right. See, yeah. man, they had us conditioned. They was cutting the corners on us. Yeah, man. <laughs> literally. <laughs> literally. Yeah, dang, I never thought about that till now. The first square pizza I ever saw, though, was the Bigfoot pizza. I yep. don't remember who it was that made it, but it was square. Yeah, I think it was Little Caesars. I had a few of those back Caesar. in the day. I think yeah, so. yeah, 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 it was. The big foot piece of square. And it was huge. That's right. And like five bucks. So we could afford it back yeah. in the day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Taylor, man, we appreciate you. We appreciate all y'all are doing. Um, we'll, we'll link everything so, so our audience can find you. Um, but thanks for joining, man. Appreciate you. Uh, no problem. Thank you.